everyone, this is Miss Pleasure on the Floyd County campus, and I'm just going to continue on with our lecture on postpartum, beginning with chapter 14, which is on page 198. It's the assessment and care of the family after birth. So next we're going to talk about nursing care during the early postpartum period, which um, is just this is just an overview of the immediate postpartum care most often occurs in the hospital. We're going to talk about uterine assessment, which is following delivery and expulsion of the placenta the size of a grapefruit and located midway, halfway between the umbilicus and the symphys pubis. Over the next several hours, the fundus rises to the level of or slightly above the umbilicus. Fundal height decreases one centimeter or one finger breadth daily. On the 10th day, the fundus should not be palpable. We're also going to assess for bogginess. And reasons for bogginess may be antony or full bladder and interventions for this. So most women remain in the hospital for two days after a vaginal delivery and three to five days after cesarean delivery. During this time, women are recovering from childbirth and assuming care for their newborns. Nurses use this time in the hospital to provide physical care and to monitor for complications. Nurses also teach the woman about self-care before discharge. After delivery and expulsion of the placenta, the uterus is about the size of a grapefruit and is located midline in the abdomen halfway between the umbilicus and the symphys pubis. And that's just the same thing as what your slide says there. So slowly over the next several hours, the fundus, which is the top portion of the uterus, will rise on the midline to the abdomen to the level of or slightly above the umbilicus. Thereafter, so after the for several hours, um, the height of the fundus will decrease by at least one centimeter or one finger breadth daily as the uterus goes through the process of involution. And we talked about involution back in chapter 13. By the 10th day, the fundus is usually not palpable. Okay, if you will look at your book on page 199 at figure 14.1 at the bottom of the page, it's an illustration of how to um, do a fundal massage. So we're going to talk about the fundal massage and how to palpate the fundus. So to palpate the fundus, the nurse should position one hand at the base of the uterus just above the symphys pubis. So that's the pelvic bone there. And the other hand at the umbilicus, which is the, um, the belly button. The nurse should press downward with a hand at the umbilicus until the fundus is palpated as a firm, hard, globular mass in the abdomen. This helps support the lower uterine segment from mashing into the symphys pubis. And if you also look on 199 under the safety stat, it also tells you that you should never palpate a uterus without supporting the lower segment because the uterus could invert if it's not stabilized. So that's why you have to keep your hand um, at the synthesis when you're palpating. Okay, and the, some of the steps that you might want to do too prior to doing your fundal assessment is having the very first thing would be to have your patient urinate just to make sure that the uterus is in the correct place and is not displaced by the bladder being overly full. And I would do that before you even begin to do your palpitation of the uterus. All right, so back to um, the uterus palpitation. The nurse will note, so in your notes, you will note the position of the fundus and document the location. Next, the nurse will assess the consistency of the mass, and that just means is it firm or is it boggy. If it is soft or boggy, the nurse will support the lower uterine segment and gently massage in a circular pattern and with the other hands until the uterus becomes firm. If massage is not effective, there may be a large blood clot in the uterus or extreme uterine atony, which atony is poor tone. Antony refers to the lack of muscle tone, which could lead to postpartum hemorrhaging. Many women receive oxytocin after delivery to promote uterine contractions, and that is usually very common to be given that post-delivery. If the uterus does not remain firm with the administration of oxytocin and massage, the healthcare provider should be notified. 
Another problem that could lead to uterine atony is a full bladder, which can displace the uterus and make involution difficult, which is why you should have your patient um, urinate prior to, to assessing the uterus. A full bladder can push the uterus to the side and interfere with uterine contractions that attempt to produce involution to control bleeding from the placenta site. The nurse should assess the patient's bladder. If bladder distension is noted, the, no the nurse should assist the patient to urinate and then reassess the uterus to determine if it is firm and has returned to the midline of the abdomen. Okay, so here again is um, a slide that is the same picture as um, figure 14.1 on page 199. So to palpate the fundus, the nurse should position one hand at the base of the uterus just above the symphys pubis and the other hand at the umbilicus. The nurse should press downward with the hand at the umbilicus until the fundus is palpated as a firm, hard, lobular mass in the abdomen. The nurse will note the position of the fundus and document the locations. And then once again, we're just going to go right back over that safety stack because this is all very important information in preventing postpartum hemorrhage. Never palpate a uterus without supporting the lower segment because the uterus could invert if not stabilized. You must always use two hands. So signs of a distended bladder. So now we're going to discuss what some of the signs are of a distended bladder in the postpartum woman. So if the fundus is above the umbilicus or above baseline level, fun the fundus may also be to one side or displaced from midline. Most often it's going to be to the right side. Also, there may be a bulge of bladder above the symphys pubis, excessive lochia, tenderness over the bladder area. There also may be frequent voiding of less than 150 milliliters of urine, which is indi indicating that you're, you have some urinary retention or overflow. So those are some things that you really want to pay very careful attention to with your postpartum woman and assessing her uterus is any signs of bladder distension, because that is definitely not a good thing as far as promoting um, the fundus to contract and to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, so next we're going to talk about lochia. So immediately after delivery, large amount of dark red blood from the uterus, which is lochia. Here are the terms you need to know about the lochia. Lochia rubra is dark red blood. Lochia serosa is brownish red to a thinner, lighter color. And lochia alba is lighter and yellowish in color. The amount of lochia. Scant is less than one inch of lochia on the pad. Light is less than four inches of lochia on the pad. Moderate is less than six inches of lochia on the pad. And heavy is a pad saturated within an hour. And then off to the side, you can see some illustrations and you can kind of follow along um, in your book on page 200, figure 14.2. Um, one of the things you really need to remember especially for testing purposes, is looking at the pad and determining what each inch would equal as far as scant, light, moderate, or heavy. So, you know, this is a little test help. Pay very special attention to that and learn that. Lochia. It is common for small clots to be present because of blood pooling in the lower uterine segment. The patient should be turned to her side to make sure that blood is not pooling under her thighs instead of being absorbed by the peri pad. Small clots can just be documented, but large clots can interfere with involution or indicate signs of hemorrhage and should be reported. So you would report that to the healthcare provider if you have um, large clots. So saying that small clots are fine, but if you have large clots, you should definitely report that to the healthcare provider because it could be indicative of hemorrhage. During the first hour after delivery, it is common for two peripads to be saturated. After the first hour, bleeding is considered excessive if the patient saturates more than one pad per hour. So we've, that's on your um, slide there too. The newly delivered patient will remain in the labor and delivery area for a minimum of one hour after delivery. 
The first hour after delivery is the most dangerous hour in childbearing because of the risk of hemorrhage after delivery. So what you're going to do during this one hour period in the labor and delivery room is check vital signs, including pulse and blood pressure every 15 minutes. Palpate the fundus of the uterus for firmness and location every 15 minutes. While assessing the uterine tone, the nurse will note the amount of vaginal bleeding. Observe the peripets for the amount of lochia, color, odor, and presence of clots. So the most important thing is know how, in these terms, how to describe lochia using the charts and the amounts. Okay, so next we're just going to talk about a postpartum assessment and what as a nurse you need to do and interventions that you might do. One of the easiest ways to remember the, the things that you need to be including or thinking about when you're going to do a postpartum assessment is bubble LE or bubble E, however you want to say that. That's just an acronym that can kind of help you remember what to look at and what you need to be charting about when you're finished. So, Bubble LE stands for breasts, uterus, bladder, bowels, lochia, episiotomy or laceration, legs, and emotion. Now on the slide that is included here on the PowerPoint, you can see that it's bubble HE. In some places they still use that, but in our area, most of the physicians no longer want you or facilities either want you to check a home inside. So we're not really doing that. If you suspect that your patient after doing an assessment that your patient might have a blood clot in her lower extremity, you would notify your healthcare provider and normally they're just going to order an ultrasound for that. So that is why, um, you know, we don't really do the home inside, but I'm leaving it on here because outside of this area, there may still be some places that still do that. So you kind of need to know what it is, but for testing purposes, we don't normally use those. We usually use the, um, do a Doppler or ultrasound of the lower extremity. So with your postpartum checks, you are going to also, in addition to doing the bubble LE, you are going to observe and record vital signs, pain, hydration status, ability to ambulate, ability to care for newborn. Before and during assessment, you need to explain to your patient what you are looking for, for teaching, as a nurse, you need to teach your patient how to assess the height and firmness of her uterus so that she can do that when she goes home. Um, also, you, when you're doing this, you need to teach her not to push down too hard because it can cause overstimulation and that can also lead to uterine atony and hemorrhage. So those are some of the things that you'll be teaching your patient to assess for herself when she's discharged from the hospital. Okay, so now we're just going to go over each part of the uh, bubble acronym in order, and you can follow along also in your book on page 200, 201, 202. So, first thing is breasts. So, you're going to assess your patient's breasts. You're going to assess the um, breast for engorgement, redness at the nipple sites, any pain. You also need to be working on teaching guidelines for managing engorgement for your non-breastfeeding patient. And there's a whole list of things that you can do for that. On um, the top part of page 201 underneath the breast tells you all about different things that you would need to teach your patient who is not breastfeeding. Okay, and then there is also patient teaching guidelines just beneath that as well that can help you. So be really familiar with that as well. For uterus, you're going to note, note, as we've talked about before, the location, the consistency, whether it's firm or boggy, um, the position. There is some cramping of the uterus, which if they have some cramping, that is normal to have cramping in the uterus, but it is not normal to have abdominal pain or abdominal tenderness, and this needs to be reported to the healthcare provider because that could be an early sign of infection or a bladder infection. So that's something that you need to report. If the uterus is not involuting as expected, note the lack of tone, the signs, if there's any signs of bladder distension or signs of infection, and you always report those findings to your healthcare provider. As you are assessing the uterus, have your patient fill for her own fundus and explain the process to her so that she understands when she goes home and she can do her own assessment.
The nurse should also, um, on the bladder, which is the next one down on the bladder, you need to palpate it when you assess the fundus. If it is descended, distended, then you need to assist your patient to the bathroom and have her urinated before completing the assessment. Some things that you might could do to help her urinate would be to pour warm water over the perineum, turn the water on so that she can hear the sound of water, place her hand in a basin of cold water to help her avoid. Those are all just some interventions that you can do without having to uh, have a catheter in. If none of those work, you know, I'll go ahead and do a bladder scan. If she is distended, you'll need to notify the physician and get an order for a Foley. That would be like a last resort for bladder distension treatment. You really don't want to go there because it could introduce infection into your patient. She's already at risk. So that's like a last resort. So you try those other interventions first. Okay, for bowels, you're just going to auscultate bowel sounds. For your patient that's had a cesarean birth, you may not be able to hear audible bowel sounds for the first several hours because the effects of anesthesia on peristalsis, and that's normal. If it's past that, then um, and you're not hearing anything, you need to notify the healthcare provider. The next thing that you would assess is lochia, which we've already gone over that in depth, so I'm going to just skip over the lochia for now. Um, because we've already been over that, so you just need to make sure that you are assessing the amount and the type, and you're also going to chart that. After that is the episiotomy or laceration. So you're going to inspect your patient's perineum. It's best viewed if you have your patient turn to her side and bring up her upper knee, so whichever leg is on top, going to get her to pull that knee up as far as she can. While the patient is on her side, you gently lift the upper buttock and inspect the perineum for bruising, redness, edema, hematoma, which is a bruise, and for um, intactness of the episiotomy or the repaired laceration. Okay, for the first 24 hours, you can offer ice packs for pain and reduction of swelling of the episiotomy or laceration site after 24 hours then you would be using warm water soaking such as a sits bath um, and we talked about how to prepare a sits back back in fundamentals and if you turn on page 202 in your book at figure 14.4 there's a picture of a sits bath so you can use those to help with pain and cleaning of the episiotomy, laceration site, or any hemorrhoids that your patient might have from pushing. Okay, the next thing is legs. You're going to assess the legs for pain, circulation, leg temperature, and edema. Just remember that because of venous stasis, your patient is at risk for forming blood clots in the lower extremities. A client is um, at increased risk for thrombophlebitis when she spends an increased time in bed during labor. Venous pooling occurs when the woman's legs are in stirrups for a long period of time, so all those contribute to possible DVT. So you're going to assess for that. And then the last one on the bubble lily is emotions. So um, they change as your patient moves through the different stages and attainment of roles of becoming a mother. Emotionally, the patient may range from being excited to apprehensive to exhibiting signs of postpartum blues with tearfulness and irritability. Okay, so nursing care following a cesarean birth, you are going to monitor the uterine involation and lochia, monitor the cesarean incision site. Your postoperative care is to prevent complications, and you're going to assess for pain at the incision site. And just remember that she, your post cesarean section patient will also need um, care that prevents complications of bed risk, such as atelectasis, thrombosis, and infection. So it's just like any other general surgery. The things that you would um, worry about complications of those would be the same for the cesarean delivery as well. So you're going to encourage ambulation, resumption of normal voiding pattern, and 
ambulation is a big thing that you could do to help prevent the sluggish blood flow in the lower extremities, so early ambulation. She may even have tet hose on as well. And then actions to support respiratory function, which that would be just using incentive spermot. I can't even say this word anymore. Incentive spirometer, and also um, deep breathing exercises. So it's just exactly like if you're taking care of any other post uh, patient as far as things you would do for lungs and for blood. So nursing care of the adolescent, same assessment and physical care as with an adult. You support and educate. You may need more structured teaching about the care of the newborn and self. Always treat as an adult. The adolescent should be treated as an adult and the nurse should not talk down to her and should be careful with the tone of the interactions. Tone of voice can indicate emotions such as anger, irritability, and disapproval. A teenager will be sensitive to the nurse's tone and attitude when receiving teaching about her newborn. The nurse should encourage questions and never make the adolescent patient feel embarrassed about any lack of knowledge. The teacher should also be the teaching should also be directed towards the teenager and not to the parents or any of the support people who may accompany her. So always, always, always treat your adolescent patient as an adult um, because you want her to be in a place where she can learn. It's especially important that she doesn't feel like you are talking down to her or treating her differently than you would an adult patient who has just given birth. Okay, so nursing care for the woman who relinquishes the infant for adoption. You need to first find out what your patient's birth plan is. Um, she may or may not want the adoptive parents present at birth. Call adoptive parents after birth. May want to hold the infant, keep the infant in the nursery. So you need to know whether or not she wants to hold the infant as the infant is born or if she just wants the infant taken away to the nursery. Um, she may not want to see or hold the infant at all. You always provide infant empathetic care and respect her wishes. She requires the same physical care and teaching as any postpartum patient. Okay, so we're going to talk about preparation for discharge and your self-care instructions to your patient. And they should include um, maybe some of the following or if not all of them. Laceration and episiotomy repair care, perineal care, breast care, hand hygiene, follow-up appointments, nutrition, exercise, and any information to report, sexual activity, and contraception. So the stitches used for lacerations and episiotomy repair will dissolve, dissolve over time. At first, the perineum may be sore and painful. Offer ice pack for the first 24 hours to reduce pain and swelling, which at the point of discharge, she's going to be ready to use the cyst bath instead of this. Uh, use acetaminophen and warm cyst bath to help control pain. As the peridium heals, it is normal for itching to occur. Continue to change the peripad after each urination and defecation. Avoid touching the inner aspects of the pad. That's when you're putting it on because you want to reduce infection risk. Because remember, that's always a, a big problem that you have to worry about is infection. Cleanse the perineum with warm water in the peri bottle. The flow of the water should be front to back, so it's just the same as if you're wiping. So you're going to teach her to do it that way as well. Do not use tampons or douche until after the follow-up appointment with the obstetrician. Continue to wear a supportive bra as the breast adjusts to milk production. And then... Um, Look at your safety stat on page 204, which just talks about your um, RH factor. So RHO immunoglobulin is administered intramuscularly within 72 hours of birth to prevent sensitization to the RH factor in an RH negative woman with an infant who is RH positive. And uh, we talked about that um, way back in the... Uh, first section of maternity. So just make sure that before she goes home, if she is RH negative and gave birth to an RH positive infant, that she has been given her Rogan shot. Okay, so next we're going to talk about some common postpartum complications.
Many problems can occur during the postpartum period, but most problems fall into the categories listed on this slide, which um, have to do with the breast, the respiratory system, the urinary system with UTIs, circulation with thrombophlebitis, um, hematoma or abscess formation, which you have to worry about with your um, laceration or your episiotomy site, endometriosis or um, perineal cellulitis. Those are things that you worry about with vaginal deliveries. Um, with the cesarean delivery, you also have the risk factors for prolonged um, labor or bladder catheterizations or hemorrhages. All those kind of things have complications of their own that you have to worry about as well in the postpartum period. So we're just going to go over those in the next few slides. Okay, so the uh, biggest complication and the most serious complication is postpartum hemorrhage. So we're going to talk about that first. Postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause of maternal mortality in the world. PPH is defined or postpartum hemorrhage is defined as blood loss of more than 500 milliliters for a vaginal delivery and more than 1,000 milliliters for a cesarean delivery. Postpartum hemorrhage that occur during the first 24 hours after birth is called early hemorrhage. The most likely time for a postpartum hemorrhage is the first four hours after birth. Late hemorrhage occurs after 24 hours and before six weeks postpartum. So even though your patient is going home, she's still at risk. So that's why you have to really do good teaching about um, assessing the lochia and the amount of her discharge and what it should look like. So risk factors for developing late hemorrhage are obesity, retained placenta, failure to progress during the second stage of labor, placental accretia, lacerations, large for gestational age newborn, instrumental delivery, which would be use of forceps or other devices, um, hypertension disorder, induction of labor, Augmentation of labor with oxytocin, so if your patient is induced, um, over distension of the uterus, or previously having postpartum hemorrhage. So those are all some of the risk factors. Okay. So next we're going to go over the four T's: tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombosis. So the four T's. Tone. Uterine atony is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage. The uterus loses tone when the muscles fail to contract after delivery of the placenta. When the muscles do not contract, the blood vessels that connected the placenta to the uterine muscles remain open, causing a rapid blood loss that can lead to hypovolemic shock. The uterine muscles may not contract because of fatigue caused by prolonged labor or forceful labor with oxytocin induction or augmentation. Possible drugs that may be administered to treat early postpartum hemorrhage, and remember early is um, within the first 24 hours after delivery, so early postpartum hemorrhage or high doses of oxytocin, which is methogen, hemobate, or cytotec, which can also be used. Those are just some of the drugs they may use. Conversely, magnesium sulfate is administered to patients to prevent seizures. Calcium channel blockers, such as Procardio, also may be used because they can inhibit um, postpartum uterine contraction. So if mom is getting these drugs, so if your mother is taking a a uh, calcium channel blocker, so if she has got hypertension or a reason to take that, then you need to be extra aware because of what it can do to the uterine muscle and the problems that it can cause because it can increase your risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, the next T is tissue. Tissue, after delivery of the fetus, the uterus contracts to release the placenta. If a portion of the placenta remains attached to the uterine wall, the uterus cannot compress the open vessels and control the bleeding. Retained placental fragments are the most common cause of late PPH or postpartum hemorrhage. 
Women with abnormal implantation of the placenta, such as placenta accretia and placenta previa, are at a higher risk for retained tissue. Careful examination of the placenta after delivery is essential. Oxyto Oxytocin are administered to expel the fragments of placenta, but may not be sufficient to expel all of the fragments. So even though she has oxytocin given, that may not um, actually get rid of all of the tissue fragments. So you still have to be aware that if she's having bleeding, that that might be a cause. A DNC may be necessary to control the bleeding. The bleeding cannot be stopped by medication or dilation and evacuation, which is a DNE. Um, the only other option would be a hysterectomy. So that's a last ditch effort to stop a hemorrhage is a hysterectomy. Okay, the third T in our four T's is trauma. Trauma to the uterus, cervix, and vagina can cause hemorrhage. Trauma includes vaginal, cervical, or peritoneal lacerations. All lacerations should be promptly sutured. Watch heart rate. 100 beats per minute may be a sign of shock. So if you have a high heart rate and low pulse, those are classic signs of hypovolemic shock. So you just need to watch out for those when you're doing your assessments. Um, Forcep delivery is the most common cause of a cervical or vaginal laceration. Lacerations can also occur from manipulation of a soldier, shoulder dystocia and by abnormal presentation of the fetus. So if you have a breached birth or um, if you have shoulder dystocia, then your patient is also at increased risk for developing a postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, so our fourth T is thrombosis. Immediately after the birth, disorders of coagulation and platelets do not result in excessive bleeding because of the work of the uterus in contracting and controlling bleeding. In the days afterward, so in the days following birth, fibrin deposits over the placenta, placental site and clots within the vessels that supplied the placenta with blood flow are needed to control bleeding. Any pre-existing conditions such as thrombocytopenia, underlying clotting disorders, or sepsis can interfere with clotting and cause a late postpartum hemorrhage. So those are a lot of reasons with your four T's why your patient might develop or have a risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, so some signs and symptoms of a postpartum hemorrhage that you need to be aware of are peripad saturation in 15 minutes or less, heavy vaginal bleeding, constant trickling or oozing of blood from the vagina, uterine atony, passing of blood clots larger than a quarter, return of lochia rubra after lochial progression to serous or alba. So if the lochia has changed over or gone from um, rubia to cirrus to serosa or alba and then turns back into local rubia lochia rubra then you may have a problem with postpartum hemorrhaging cool clammy pale skin tachycardia and decreased blood pressure so the cool clammy pale skin tachycardia and decreased blood pressure those are classic signs of um, hypovolemic shock setting in those are some signs you need to be very aware of and recognize quickly and treat. Okay, so how do you know if it's hypovolemic shock? Well, you need to recognize the specific causes, stop the blood loss, assess level of consciousness, start IV fluids, monitor vital signs, provide supplemental oxygen, and prepare for um, emergency room as indicated. And that would be if they've already gone home. If it's not, if they're there on the floor still, then you're going to do all the other things. So um, postpartum hemorrhage can turn into hypovolemic shock. The body responds to hypovolemia, which is the reduced blood volume. And we have talked about this back in fundamentals. We talk about it in um, module one, two. We talk about it just about every module of your nursing um, instruction time just because it's so so very life-threatening so we want you to recognize and know how to treat hypovolemic shock so it's just the reduced blood volume so some of the things that you will notice with a reduced blood volume is an increase in your heart rate and respirations and, and at the same time you will generally see a decrease in your blood pressure 
management of hypovolemic shop is listed on your slide here. And I just read those to you. A nurse states, if, if you do have a patient that um, you're suspecting of going into hypovolemic shock or having these signs and symptoms, what you're going to do is stay with the patient and continue to do the fundal massage with continual local, local lower segment support. So keep doing the fundal massages, monitor the vital signs, assess the patient's level of consciousness, and assess the amount of vaginal bleeding. When excessive vaginal bleeding loss is observed, the nurse initial action should be to begin your fundal massage. Another team member needs to notify the physician or nurse midwife of the suspected hemorrhage. If massage, compression, and medications are not successful in slowing bleeding, the patient will be moved to the operating room for an invasive procedure to conclude to occlude the vessel with a clot uterine artery ligation. So basically, if your patient is not responding to um, the massage or any of the other treatments, then you're going to prepare her to go to the OR. And I don't think that I mentioned to you guys earlier, but if you look on page 206 at the bottom of the page on table 14, one, those are all of your medications for treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. So just kind of be familiar with those as well. Okay, so this slide just has some statistics about postpartum hemorrhaging, and it's basically saying that uh, postpartum hemorrhage is a nice way of saying we let women bleed to death. We will not let women bleed to death on our watch, so you have to be very vigilant about noticing any signs of impeding postpartum hemorrhage or going into hypovolemic shock. So what is the nursing care priority in the immediate postpartum period? And that would always be prevention of hemorrhage and hypovolemic shock. Okay, so the next couple of slides that we have are other complications in the postpartum, postpartum period. And you can look at this starting on 208 in your books. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a hematoma. A hematoma is a collection of blood outside of a vessel. The blood accumulates because the wall of an artery, a vein, or a capillary has been damaged and blood leaks into the tissue surrounding the vessel. Common locations of hematomas are in the vaginal wall or the vulva area. Risk factors for hematoma formation during or after childbirth are episiotomies, lacerations to the genital tract, delivery using forceps or vacuum extraction, nulliparia, and a difficult or prolonged second stage of labor. The signs and symptoms of a hematoma are constant pain and pressure in the vagina or rectal area, dislocation or bruising and bulging of the tissue, tenderness of the tissue, a feeling of needing to defecate because of pressure on the rectum, inability to urinate because of pressure on the urethra, or possible signs of shock if the hematoma is large. If the hematoma is less than three to five centimeters in size, ice is applied for 20 minutes every two hours for about 12 hours. Then warm sits baths are prescribed. The sits bath will provide comfort and assist with reabsorption of the clot. If the hematoma is larger than five centimeters, the woman may be taken to the operating room for sedation so that the hematoma can be drained. If significant blood loss has occurred, the patient is managed the same as someone who has had a postpartal hemorrhage. Okay, so next we're going to talk about uterine infections. Women who experience a prolonged labor, experience a prolonged rupture of membranes, undergo internal monitoring, experience a cesarean delivery, or have frequent vaginal infections are at risk for uterine infections. Another word for uterine infection is endometritis. So endometritis is a uterine infection. So um, bacteria that is normally present in the vagina cervix, such as um, E. coli and group B, strep or GBS, can enter the uterus and infect the lining of the uterus after the rupture of membranes. 
So elevated temperature greater than 38.3 Celsius or 101.4 Fahrenheit for two or more consecutive days. Foul smelling lochia, scanty odorless lochia may be noted when the infection is caused by group A beta hemolytic strep. And those are just some of the um, some of the signs and symptoms you may see. Lower abdominal tenderness at one or both sides of the abdomen. Nursing care for the patient with endometritis includes the following. Administration of IV fluids and antibiotics. Administering pain medications and antipyretics for fever as ordered. Encourage fluid intake. Explaining each treatment and rationale to the patient. Supporting her with bonding and breastfeeding. Teaching should address taking the prescribed antibiotic until finished to ensure complete eradication of the infection. Checking temperature daily and notifying practitioner if it is above 100.4. Washing hands thoroughly before and after eating. Using the bathroom, touching the perineal area, or providing newborn care, so hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Handling pads by the edges and avoid touching the inner aspects of the pad that is against the body, and directing peri, peri bottles so that the flow is from front to back. So those are all things that you can teach to help reduce uterine infection. Okay, so some other complications that you have to be aware of may be occurring in the postpartum period are wound infections and urinary tract infections. So first we're going to talk about wound infections. On the slide, you can see there is an acronym RITA that kind of helps maybe to let you remember what you're assessing for with infection. RITA stands for redness, edema, ecchymosis, discharge, and approximation, and that's all related to your wound. And you can also use that with any wound you're assessing because you're going to look for those things. And if you have any of them, that's usually indicate, indicative of having some type of infection. So for the postpartum patient, wound infections can occur in the episiotomy incision, the perineal lacerations, and in cesarean incision sites. Signs and symptoms of a wound infection for postpartum patients include redness, warmth, poor wound approximation, tenderness or pain, fever and malaise if the wound is untreated. Medical management of the postpartum wound infection usually includes laboratory studies such as a CBC and a wound culture and the administration of antibiotics. Nursing care for the patient with a wound infection includes the following, obtaining a wound culture if ordered, administering antibiotics as ordered, and one important thing to know about those two things, not only in your postpartum patient, but any patient that you have an order for that says to get a wound culture and then and give antibiotics, always, always, always get your wound culture before you begin antibiotics because that can affect what it cultures out and what your um, bacteria is actually sensitive to. So it's important to always get your culture before you start antibiotics. Okay, so more nursing care would be to encourage adequate fluid intake and protein intake to aid in healing, assessing for pain and medicate as ordered, teaching the patient proper hand washing to prevent the spread of bacteria. So all of those are nursing care for wound infection. So next we're going to talk about urinary tract infections. Ur urinary tract infections are common in the immediate postpartum phase. Your, the urethra and bladder can be traumatized as the, baby, as the baby moves through the birth canal for delivery. Women who have a Foley catheter during labor or women who have prolonged labors are at a higher risk for developing a UTI. The most common organis organisms causing a UTI are the normal bowel flora, which include E. coli, Clevisella, Proteus, and Endobacter. Bacter species. So those are the most common causative organisms for um, urinary tract infections in the postpartum period. So some signs and symptoms of a UTI are urine, urgency of urination, 
dysuria, which is painful urination, increased frequency of urination, urination in small amounts, fever, flank pain, and hematuria, which is blood in the urine, which may be kind of difficult to tell if you have lochia going on. So some nursing care for your patient with a UTI includes the following, and it's the same with any kind of UTI, whether it's postpartum or not, is administrating, administering antibiotics, encourage fluid intake to assist with flushing the bacteria out of the urinary tract, teaching the patient to clean the perineum from front to back, and to use peri bottles provided for cleansing after urination and defecation and hand washing. Okay, in the next slide, we're going to talk about a couple more postpartum complications. Um, the first we're going to talk about is mastitis, which you can read about that starting on page 210 in your book. Mastitis is an infection of the breast tissue. The most common organism to cause mastitis is Staphylococcus aurorus, which is transmitted from the breastfeeding infant's mouth or throat. Mastitis is characterized by tender, hot, red, painful area on the affected breast. With mastitis, the breast is distended with milk and the area is inflamed and there is breast tenderness. So you're looking for redness and inflammation. S. aureus, which is the type of organism, the staphylococcus Staphylococcus aureus or S. aureus is what another way of saying it is, is also present on a woman's hands. Okay, that, so that's where it lives, is mouth and hands. The bacteria can enter the mother's breath through cracked nipples using an, caused by improper latch on of the infant or by the mother touching her own breast. So you have to be very careful and mindful of that. And teach your patient to wash hands and, you know, be careful about any kind of cracks on our nipples and taking care of that. Also, if you notice that, then it may be a good idea to go over some more teaching of uh, latch on techniques for breastfeeding as well. Mastitis can also develop from blocked milk ducts and milk sta stasis. So that means milk that's just in there. Also caused by improper latch on of the infant. So Milk stasis is also caused by that. So it sounds like if you start seeing mastitis, that might be your clue that your mother needs some help and some, some teaching with, with proper breath, breast feeding techniques, especially with getting the infant to latch on. On page 211, figure 14.8, there's a picture of what it would look like if you had some mastitis. Mastitis usually occurs in one breast with a sudden onset of symptoms. Signs and symptoms of mastitis are red swollen areas or masses on the breast, fever of 98.3 or 101.4 or higher, pain or a burning sensation while breastfeeding, skin redness often in wedge shaped patterns and malaise. Mastitis can cause mom not to breastfeed because of the pain that's involved. So that should also, and they'll talk, talk more about that in the new care of the newborn, but you know, you have to worry if the mother's not breastfeeding about taking care of um, the baby's nutritional needs. We're not going to go into that here, but you'll hear more about that in the newborn care. Nursing care includes teaching the mother to wash her hands before handling her breast for breastfeeding and observing and also observing latch on of her infant and teaching the correct method of latch on. So, those are all ways of treating mastitis. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about postpartum from thrombolic disease. Thromboembolism is a condition in which the blood vessel becomes inflamed and a blood clot develops. A postpartum patient risk for venous thrombosis is highest in the first 12 weeks after delivery. This is because of the pregnancy-related hypercoagulation caused by hormones and by sluggish blood flow to the legs during pregnancy and delivery. The major cause of thrombosis and venous stasis, hypercoagulable blood, and injury to the endothelial, endothelial surface of the blood vessel. 
A pregnant woman experiences compression of the large vessels in the leg and pelvis due to the weight of the uterus causing venous stasis. During pregnancy, the fibrin levels are elevated, which can promote clot formation during pregnancy and during the postpartum recovery period. Blood vessels can be damaged by lower extremity trauma and prolonged labor and pushing. All of these factors that occur during pregnancy greatly increases the risk of thrombo and thromboembolic disorders. Sudden unexplained shortness of breath and complaints of chest pain along with diaphoresis and hypotension suggest a pulmonary embolism or PE which requires immediate action. Other signs and symptoms include tachycardia, apprehension, hemoptysis, which is coughing blood or spitting up blood, syncope, sudden change of the woman's mental status secondary to hypoxemia. So risk factors for VTE or for, uh, for um, DVTs or VTEs are obesity, prolonged bed rest, advanced maternal age, stillbirth, premature birth, gestational diabetes, cesarean deliver, delivery, multiparity, so more than one deli baby delivered at a time, uh, varicose veins, and smoking. Nursing care for the woman with thromboembolic disorders include the following. Administering heparin or Levinox is ordered, monitoring the INR and PT and notifying the healthcare provider of results, applying compression stockings correctly for up to 12 weeks with us tet hose. Um, if you do not have those on correctly, it can impede blood flow and cause venous stasis. So make sure that those are on correctly and not too tight or binding the legs in a way that causes more problems. Maintaining bed rest for the patient with the affected leg elevated, administering analgesics is ordered, applying moist heat per hospital policy, monitoring for complications such as pulmonary emboli. The symptoms are shortness of breath, chest pain, and cough. So those are all classic signs of pulmonary embolism, what you never want to see in a patient. So if you see any of those signs and symptoms, you need to notify the healthcare provider immediately. So next we're going to talk about postpartum depression and postpartum psychiatric disorders. So postpartum depression is more serious and incapacitating than postpartum blues. It can interfere with a woman's ability to care for herself and her newborn. Postpartum depression occurs in 10 to 15% of women and usually develops during the first four months postpartum but can occur anytime in the first year after childbirth. Women at highest risk of developing postpartum depression are those with personal history of depression or postpartum depression with a previous birth. Other risk factors that have been identified are recent stressful life events, lack of social support, unintended pregnancy, and financial factors. Recognition of the prompt intervention and prompt interventions of postpartum depression are important for maternal and infant well-being. Signs and symptoms of postpartum depression include intense sadness, anxiety, feelings of guilt or inadequacy, ambivalence toward the baby and family, lack of motivation for self-care or infant care, a anhedonia, which is a lack of pleasure, appetite disturbances, insomnia, fatigue, suicidal thoughts, and preoccupation with death. So if you see any of those signs and symptoms, that should clue you in that you may be dealing with postpartum depression. Nursing care includes monitoring for signs of suicidal thoughts, encourage compliance in taking antidepressant medications, encourage follow-up visits with her health care provider, encourage the patient to seek counseling, advising the patient to get rest and nap when the baby sleeps, making referrals to community agencies such as depression support groups, and encouraging the patient to verbalize her feelings and reinforce her personal power and autonomy.
postpartum psychosis is the most severe form of postpartum psychiatric illness. Psychosis causes the patient to lose touch with reality and inaccurately perceive the environment. It occurs in 1 to 2 per 1,000 postpartum women. The women at highest risk for postpartum psychosis have a history of bipolar illness or a previous episode of postpartum psychosis. This disorder typically has an abrupt onset within 48 to 72 hours of birth. Most women manifest signs and symptoms by two weeks postpartum. Signs and symptoms of postpartum psychosis are restlessness, insomnia, irritability, incoherent conversations, rapidly shifting mood from depression to elation, delusional beliefs that may relate to the infant. For example, she may think that the baby is better off dead auditory hallucinations that may tell her to harm herself or the infant, and delirium. Nursing care for the woman experienced postpartum psychosis includes immediately reporting any abnormal psychiatric symptoms to the health care provider, reorienting the patient to her surroundings, providing for safety for the patient and her baby, arranging for admission to a psychiatric facility, and providing emotional support for the patient and her family. So remember, above all, listen to what a woman is saying verbally and with her body language. This slide just contains um, kind of a flow chart to tell you the difference between postpartum blues, depression, and postpartum psychosis. So the woman may neglect or harm her own infant or herself. Listen to what the woman is saying verbally and with her body language. So if she says, oh yes, I feel fine, but you can tell that she hasn't bathed or her hair is a mess or she's talking um, incoherently, pay, pay attention to that. Look at the big picture. Postpartum blues are manifested by mild depressive symptoms of anxiety, irritability, mood swings, cheerfulness, increased sensitivity, feelings of being overwhelmed and fatigue. They are usually self-limiting and require no formal treatment other than reassurance and validation of the woman's experiences as well as assistance in caring for herself and newborn. Postpartum depression is a major depressive episode associated with childbirth. Postpartum psychosis is at, is at the severe end of the con continu continuum of postpartum emotional disorders. So postpartum psychosis is the worst of the disorders. Bipolar disorder refers to a mood disorder typically involving episodes of depression and mania. So it's really important that you understand the differences between postpartum blues, depression, and psychosis, and that when you suspect that someone is having something more than just postpartum blues that you do notify the health care provider and keep your patient and the baby safe. All right, so now we have finished with our chapter 14, so we're just going to do a couple of questions here. The first question is, a patient who delivered vaginally a week ago used tampons for the vaginal drainage and now has a fever. What should the patient be instructed to do? A, take a warm bath. B, notify the healthcare provider. C, perform, perform perineal care and rest. D, take an over-the-counter antipyretic medication. Okay, that's gonna be B. You're gonna notify the healthcare provider. That's what she needs to do. Um, first of all, you should look at your question here. Remember, we talked about tampons, and she's not to be using tampons at all until she's seen um, for the obstetrician for a follow-up appointment. So the patient could have an infection that should notify the healthcare provider of the temperature elevation. A warm bath will not help if the infection is present. Perineal care and rest will not help with an infection, and the healthcare provider will determine the best treatment for the infection, which may or may not include antipyretic medication. Okay.
Okay, and so the last question is, a postpartum patient has a two centimeter hematoma on the perineum. What should the nurse do first for this patient? A, apply ice packs. B, apply warm soaks. C, prepare a sitz bath. D, immediately notify the healthcare provider. So if you remember back when we're talking about hematomas, that's within the um, lesser range, the two centimeters. So the first thing you're going to do is apply ice pack A. If it's less than three to five centimeters, ice is applied for the to the hematoma for, for 12 hours. So it's every two hours for 12 hours. Don't leave it on for the full 12 hours. The warm sits baths are prescribed. Warm soaks are not prescribed for a hematoma. This is not a medical emergency and the health care provider does not need to be immediately notified. All right, so that's it for chapter 14. Um, my study suggestions for you guys is like, like I tell you each time, always, always, always know your key terms. Anywhere that it has a safety stat, if you see a table, if you see anything that... Um, is in bold text, those are words and terms you really need to know. And luckily, unlike the last couple of weeks, these are both 13 and 14 are both really short chapters, so there's no reason not to read all of those, because um, it's really gonna help you.